with mysterious chanting, hidden secrets and huge vaulted cathedrals. Movies have almost always portrayed monks in a way that is intriguing, but largely fictional. The world has been influenced for centuries by monasticism, and so it is worth taking a short introductory look into the Christian world of monks and monasteries. The word monk comes from an old Greek word that means alone or solitary. It's the same origin as the prefix of mono that we use in a lot of English words today. And so a monastery is a group of people living alone together. But this beautiful irony shows the words for what they are, that the word monk and the word monastery are words made up by non-monks to try and understand what monasticism is all about. Because being a monk is actually the polar opposite of being alone. It is seeking fellowship and relationship of the most powerful kind, fellowship with the most holy trinity. The monks are in a community with the saints and with the church at large, and most importantly, with Jesus Christ. Monastics are men and women who have dedicated their entire lives to that relationship with God. They do not get married and they do not have families, but they take vows and they are part of the eternal family of Christ's holy church. A contemporary criticism of monasticism by Christian groups that have forgotten monasticism is that it goes against a biblical rule to be in the world, but not of it. And the criticism is suggesting that the monks have run away from their duty to be in the world. But this criticism doesn't hold up either through a short look at monasticism today or a short look at monasticism in history. Much of the Christian world received Christianity through monastics. There are entire cities and towns that exist purely because they were built around monasteries. And much of the Christian world's understanding of culture, music, poetry, literature and medicine all come from the monasteries. Monastics clearly have never abandoned the world, instead they have poured a lot into it. In this day and age we can still see that this is the case. Monasteries around the world welcome in countless pilgrims and people in need. They welcome in the homeless, the needy, the addicted, the hurt, and the world-weary Christian and pilgrim. A good Christian doesn't or shouldn't run away from the world, but many a good and holy Christian has run towards the monastery. The monks and nuns that I know and that I have known throughout my life have mostly been funny, cheerful, honest, good, kind people. They have been people with whom I have spent wonderful conversations. Several of them are actually watching patristics. And it's very clear to me that they have never abandoned the world. They are very, very much in the world, but not of it. Christian monasticism began to get going properly in around the 4th century in North Africa. This was a point in time in which the persecution of Christianity had ended. The world was safer for Christians. This age of peace and prosperity was seen by some as a new form of challenge. Because when your life is on the line and you might get killed for being a Christian, you have to really discern what you believe and what you will give up for it. However, if everything is peaceful and comfortable, it's a lot easier to just say, I'm a Christian, without actually changing the way you live and the way you respond to the world around you. Many men and women chose to live a life of struggle over a life of comfort. They ventured out into the wilderness, there to focus entirely on prayer. Over time, they began to form communities known as monasteries. These monasteries focused entirely on that relationship with God and on that spiritual battleground. As time progressed, people from the cities would often visit these monasteries and these monks living far away in remote places to seek wisdom about the Holy Scriptures, wisdom about relationship with God, and solace from the noise and confusion of the world to focus entirely on God. As Christianity continued to spread across the world, monasteries began to be formed in new regions, in new countries, in new areas, further and further afield. And as people grew closer to those monasteries, monasteries would go even further, spreading Christianity, but also transforming entire landscapes, roads, cities, and towns, being built entirely around this landscape transforming movement of monasticism. There are several people who can be seen as history's first Christian monks, and some of them come from the age of Christian persecution. Generally, the father of monasticism is seen as being St. Anthony the Great. St. Anthony was a pivotal person in the history of Christian monasticism and knew very, very many different saints, including St. Athanasius of Alexandria, the man who compiled the New Testament that all Christians recognize today. He was a very important figure who loved God. He wanted very much to give his life to God. He would have liked to have been 
a martyr, but God had other plans for him, and Anthony lived to the old age of 105, having guided many monks across the desert, and been seen by monks today as one of the greatest examples of monastic spirituality. While Anthony can be seen as one of the founders of Christian monasticism, he was also building on journeys far older than his, lives like that of John the Baptist or Elijah the prophet, who were called by God out into the wilderness to live a life dedicated to him. At some points, they were called to affect society around them, as have been many monks all through history. One of the main jobs of monks is to pray, and as Christians, we all believe that prayer has effect, and monks pray more than anyone and so surely they are having effect on the world around them constantly. Monasticism continues around the Christian world to this day. It has developed slightly differently in the Western or Catholic world to the Eastern or the Orthodox Christian world. In the West, you will see different orders of monks, Benedictines, Dominicans, Franciscans, and so on. In the Eastern Orthodox world, we just have monastics. Every monastery has its own ministry and goals. Every monastery has its own practices. Some of them are centuries and centuries old. Some of them have been built in living memory. Some have hundreds of monks, some have only a handful. These monasteries can be found all over the world. They can be found in very remote and very hard to reach places, or they can be found almost like a spiritual oasis in the middle of a busy city. Most of these monasteries can be visited and all of them contribute to the church at large. This can be through the production of prayer books or of prayer ropes. This can be through the creation of iconography. But most importantly, it is through constant and dedicated prayer to Jesus Christ. For those not familiar with monasticism, it is often easy to draw comparisons between the family and the monastery, or that having a family is more important than being a monk. But the family and the monastery are two very separate callings in the church. Since the coming of Christ, we are all able to communicate directly with God, to have a relationship with God. The early church and traditional Christian groups today that still love and practice monasticism know that the one relationship that truly matters is the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. All other relationships depend on this one. All other relationships should serve this one. The church doesn't see being single as a failure, nor does it see marriage as being a success in and of itself. But both of these forms of relationship are ways that can be used to love and honor and serve God to build that central relationship. Monks take vows of purity, obedience, and of poverty, or better said, unattachment to worldly things. These are all good things for everyone to practice. Both a monk in a monastery and a person working in a cafe are called by God to the same virtues practiced in different ways and in different aspects of life. St. John Chrysostom, himself a monk of the 4th century, wrote some very powerful life advice for married couples, talking about supporting each other, praying together, and not fearing the challenges of life. And in these writings, he has a very powerful quote where he says, If your marriage is like this, your perfection will rival the holiest of monks. To quote two monks from the 20th century, both of whom are saints, we have St. Nikon of Optina, who says that every form of Christian life has its own virtues and occupations. And St. Porphyrios says that a person can become a saint anywhere. The beauty of Christianity is that Jesus is close to all of us, that all of us can grow in relationship to him. In scripture, Jesus recommends that we go into the quiet place to pray, and he often did so himself. We often do this. We go to our icon corner, or we go to our church, or we go to a quiet place where we can just be in prayer. Some, however, go much further away. Some choose to go and live in that quiet place, in that life, of relationship with God. There they face all sorts of their own challenges, and there these monastics are praying for us and for the world. For that, the entire world should be glad that these prayers are continuously happening. And every now and again, we should go and try and visit our brothers and sisters there serving Christ in the monasteries. That was a very short introductory episode to Christian monasticism. There is so much more that can be said and that can be learned. And there is a lot of beautiful things to discover in that world. The best people to ask about it are, of course, themselves. Talk to a monk or an unvisitor monastery and chat with someone there about life. And of course, our thanks and our greetings to our monastic friends that watch this channel. We hope we have given a good introduction into the work that you do. Thank you very much for your prayers. At the end of all these episodes, we tend to mention what tea we are drinking, and today it is ginseng tea, which is very healthy, apparently, and not too bad tasting either.